Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome, all of you here at the property, those of you participating uh, online. Uh, let's all rejoice and be glad in this new day that our God has made and has given to us. Amen. I am Pastor Jonathan. Welcome to all of you. I'm glad that you're here. I welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the name that is above every name, the name that every knee will bow before, and one day every tongue will confess that He is the Lord. And if you've already made that confession, if Jesus Christ is your Lord, then know that He will come and meet with you today by His Holy Spirit, ministering to your heart and the places that you need it. And if you're still checking Jesus out, you're not sure what you believe concerning Him, maybe you don't want anything to do with Him. We are super glad that you're here. We're very, very glad that you're here. You're very welcome here. And we hope that you'll hear the good news of God's love for you in Jesus Christ today, and you will say yes to Him as your Lord and Savior. Well, as we begin our service, let's do so by praying, even if you're not yet a Christian. I encourage you, say, God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And if you already belong to the Lord, say, come and minister to me. Let's have a silent prayer, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Lord our God, we gather today to ascribe the glory that is due your name, to worship you in the splendor of holiness because you are great and greatly to be praised. We come to bless your holy name and song. We come to, to offer you all that we are and all that we have as an offering in your sight, our God. Please come and meet with us today. Whatever we bring in here, we pray that you'd meet with us today by the ministry of the Holy Spirit so that we'd fear you above all gods, that we'd tremble before you as the true God, and that we'd leave here wanting to declare your glory and your marvelous deeds in the gospel of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're able to stand with me, please do so. God begins our worship services each week by calling us to worship him from his very word. And today he does that from Psalm 96. Listen to God's call to worship. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, he is to be feared above all gods. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Amen. Well, in response to God calling us to worship him, let's confess, let's profess what we believe as followers of Jesus Christ, joining countless voices from all over the nations as we use the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. Christians with one voice, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. To our God, the glory that is due to Him. So let's sing this song. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Yo 
to our lungs when you created us, but it is only right that with every ounce of our being, and especially with our, with our songs here, that we lift up your name, that we give glory back to you. Lord, we know that we need your mercy and your grace to even properly worship you for who you are. So we ask that as this service continues, that you would fill our eyes with the right vision of who you truly are as we continue to hear about uh, the legacy of Jesus' ministry on earth that we are to carry, um, Lord, help us, Lord, to for our eyes and our minds and our hearts to be filled with visions of your wonder and your glory. Help us to bow down before you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Uh, glad to have all of you worshiping here together with us, and it's just so great to lift up the name of our God together. My name is G, I'm a member here, and I'll just give you a few quick announcements. We have nursery care available for those four and under, so please feel free to take advantage of that. The children are more than welcome to stay in this room uh, for our service. And now just take a few moments and greet one another, and we'll continue with our service here.
Right. All right. If I can encourage you all now to find your seats, please return to your seats and we'll continue. Thank you. It is really great to worship with all of you this day. Uh, I'm Pastor Sherwin, and we come now to the uh, portion of our worship service where as part of our worship, we pray together to God. And uh, we often follow the Lord's Prayer for this. It's the very prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6. I want us to consider one phrase in the prayer that Jesus taught us, and that's the phrase, give us this day our daily bread. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. And right away, we see that what Jesus teaches us there is the very opposite of how we tend to think of our lives. When we think of our lives, we can think there are some real things that we're not in control of, that we need God's help for, real ways in which we depend upon God. But then there are all sorts of ways in which, you know, we got it ourselves. We got it. We can plan for it. We can bank on our resources. We have the ability. Some things we really need God for, and other things we kind of, we got, we got it taken care of. But what Jesus teaches us here is, the truth that there is nothing that we have that God doesn't first provide to us, that all we have has been given to us, and the things we need every day to live, the food we need, the life, even breath itself, we desperately depend upon God to give and provide for us. We are helpless and we are needy. And the reason why that's not threatening is because in Jesus, God Himself has become our loving Father. And God has become the ocean of provision in our desperate need. What do we need today? What do you need today? When we come to God in prayer, therefore, it's not just offering to God like religious obligation, like paying taxes. When we pray to God, we are children coming before our loving Father who gives us what we need. So let's do that right now. Let us join our voices and pray in need to our God using the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And God, as we continue praying to you now for the preaching of your word, we ask you to please help us. Would you help Pastor Jonathan and fill him with your Holy Spirit right now, fill him with all boldness, and give to him the truth that we desperately need to hear today? Would you help us as well to pay careful attention to the very words of life, the scriptures that are able to make us wise for salvation and equip us for every good work. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen, amen. Just want to reiterate what Pastor Sherwin said about how good it is to be with uh, all of you today. We praise the Lord that we can uh, gather together publicly without the threat of persecution, unlike so many of our brothers and sisters around the world. So let us be grateful to our God for that. And I'm especially excited. I'm kind of an excitable person to begin with, but I'm very excited to be uh, beginning the book of Acts today, the book right after the Gospel of John, so many of us have been studying. And we're going to be uh, diving in today, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, which will be on the screen behind me, also on the screen for those of you participating online. Uh, this will take us through the next year plus, and uh, Pastor and I are very excited to learn what God wants us to learn, that God would give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to this church as we study the book of Acts. So Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11 on the screen, and then following uh, uh, the reading of God's Word, we'll have the response that we do uh, every week from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. That works, that's where our response to God's Word uh, comes from every week. So if you can stand one more time, please do so with me as we honor God and the reading of His holy word, the first 11 verses of the book of Acts. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when He was taken up, after He had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom He had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by, by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, every family has a history. Now, sometimes your family history may be something you're proud of, or your family history might be something you're embarrassed by. Maybe when you think of your family history, it's something that really warms your heart. Or, sadly, maybe when you think about your family history, it breaks your heart. Family history and knowing it is important. And that's actually why we have been given the book of Acts. It's a historical account of our family's history, family being the church of Jesus Christ. So that the church today in the 21st century would learn from the good and the bad and the ugly, the trials and the joys, the temptations, the failures and the victory, all from our family 2,000 years ago, so that we might walk more faithfully with the Lord our God today. Acts is the unfolding of God's plan of salvation after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus as we see Jesus continue to be at work even though he was ascended into heaven because he's at work by the Holy Spirit through the church, which he has been doing for 2,000 years. And by way of outline, you'll see in verses 1 through 5, the acts of Jesus' past work, So the acts of Jesus' past work. And then in verses 6 through 8, the acts of Jesus' present work. So you see the acts of Jesus' past work, the acts of Jesus' present work. And then in verses 9 through 11, the acts of Jesus' promised work. The acts of Jesus' past work, present work, and promised work. Now, the introduction will be a little bit longer as we're starting a new book today, but it's important to say that Every time we study a new book of the Bible, there is a divine author to that book, God himself, and yet there's always a human author that God has used to write that book. And it's universally believed that Acts was written by Luke, the author of the third gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, many of us studied John, the fourth gospel. And the reason why people think this is, is, uh, there's a few reasons why people think this. One is, it's very similar in style and in detail to the Gospel of Luke, Acts is. Now, you'd have, you could see that more clearly from the Greek language, the language of the original, the, the original language of both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. In detail and style, very, very similar. And they're written to the same person. You see in verse 4 here, Luke writes to Theophilus, the same person he wrote to in Luke chapter 1. So Acts is kind of like volume 2, of the two volumes set from Luke. The Gospel of Luke is the first volume, and then Acts is the second volume. We'll see it manifests itself that Luke is the only non-Jewish author of the New Testament. That'll come out at times throughout the writing as well. According to other scriptures, Luke was a, a doctor. And we'll see in Acts he was a historian. He wrote with great detail, precision. But Acts is not a doctrinal discourse like the book of Romans, for instance. No, it is historical data to bridge the Old Testament promises with their fulfillment in Jesus and their application 
to the nations, bridging all of those things together. That's why we have the book of Acts. The book of Acts is about life for the church in the end times. You say, well, when are the end times? Well, the end times were inaugurated. They began when Jesus was raised from the grave. And the end times will be consummated when Jesus returns from heaven. The church has been living in the end times for 2,000 years. Now we'll see in the, the book of Acts, the very first person who died for the Lord Jesus Christ, the first martyr, Stephen. Of course, there's been countless of thousands of others who've died for Jesus over the last 2,000 years, but the first one was Stephen. We'll also see in the book of Acts the first time that believers in Jesus are called Christians. It, wasn't, it was kind of a derogatory term, actually, which we'll see. We'll see some very important themes in the book of Acts for the life of our church, things like prayer, things like unity in the church, or disunity, sadly, in the church. We'll see in the book of Acts that church is, is meant to be family. It's meant to have fellowship and even food. We will see the urgency of local and global evangelism, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. In Acts, we're going to have some 20 sermons or presentations of the gospel that we can learn from. And I dare say we need the similar urgency and boldness that we'll see in the gospel or in, the, in Acts concerning local and global evangelism. So why did Luke write Acts? Well, he wanted the church in the first century and 2,000 years later, although he didn't know we, uh, that we would still be tarrying like this, but he wanted the church to be great. And here's, here's what I mean by that. He wanted the church to be a great commandment church, growing in loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Luke wanted the church to be a great church, a great commandment church, but also a great commission church, serious about getting the good news of Jesus Christ outside of the church to others who need to hear of him. The very thing that we should want for grace and peace. We want to be a great church, but not great in the worldly sense. We want to be growing and understanding the great commandment to love God and the great commission to love others by sharing the gospel with them. If there was a title to the book of Acts, in fact, you can actually see it, the Acts of the Apostles. You couldn't title this too, the Acts of the Holy Spirit or of the Holy Ghost. Or maybe the most practical title to the book of Acts would be something like this. The Acts of Jesus by the Holy Ghost through the Apostles and then through the church. It's the acts of Jesus by the Holy Spirit through the apostles and then through the church. Now, Acts is applicable to the 21st century church everywhere. And in particular, Acts is applicable to grace and peace. As we learn from Acts what the church is to be, what the church is to do, what the church is to focus on, and how we do those things as we learn from our family history. So, the Acts of Jesus' past work, verses 1 through 5. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he'd given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the, of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, in Luke's first book, the Gospel of Luke, he wrote all that Jesus began to do and teach as the church was beginning. What many of us learn from the Gospel of John was simply considered believing was simply considered the beginning of Jesus works and his teachings according to Luke there was more to be done and that's what we're going to study in acts and it was before his ascension into heaven which we will see in a bit it's actually how Luke ended the gospel of Luke with Jesus ascending into heaven and it's how he's beginning the book of acts with Jesus ascending into heaven volume 1 and volume 2 
But before Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave commands by the Holy Spirit after he was raised from the grave. He was raised from the grave and eventually would ascend into heaven. But in between that time, he gave commands. He said things like, believe in me. I'm alive from the dead. Feed my people. Tend to my, sh- uh, my sheep. And then in Matthew 28, as important as anything else that Jesus said after he was raised from the grave and before he ascended in to heaven was the revelation of the job description for the church, which has not changed in 2,000 years. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on, and, and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The companionship of Jesus the fact that he's with his people always, and the calling of Jesus to make disciples, to make followers of people from all the nations of the world. The, call, the companionship and the calling go hand in hand because Jesus is the one who does the work, but he does the work through his people. And he commanded his people to do this after he was raised from the grave before he ascended in to heaven. Now, he spoke to many people after he was raised from the grave, but in particular, he spoke to the apostles, those whom he himself had chosen, appointed, and set apart. It's a good reminder that leaders in the church are set apart uh, by Jesus, but they're not just set apart by Jesus. They need, to con- they need to continue to have Jesus' blessing on them, so it's a small reminder to be praying for those that Jesus has set apart. Now, after his sufferings, his terrible sufferings, before he went to the cross, and then on the cross in his body and soul, after his sufferings, he was raised from the grave. And he showed himself to be alive. He showed himself to the apostles and to many others that he'd conquered his own sufferings. He'd conquered the reality of death. He'd con- conquered the reality of the sin of sinners like you and me. And he proved that he was alive by many proofs. He walked through a door when he went to hang out with his friends. He walked through a door. He told Thomas, hey, touch my pierced hands. Touch my pierced sides. If you don't really think I am alive, look, I'm walking through doors. Look, you can see where the nails were put into me and where the meat was torn out of my side. And he did all of these things for his apostles over the span of 40 days, roughly six weeks, proving over and over and over again, I am alive and I have commands before you. Now, 40 days is huge in the Bible. You could do an entire sermon. You could do a sermon series on 40 days in the Bible. Moses, the Old Testament, the chief Old Testament pastor uh, and leader, received God's law, the Ten Commandments, over a 40-day period. Jesus himself, while he was here on earth, was tempted by the devil to sin over 40 days and 40 nights. Of course, he didn't cave in in order to be the sinless and acceptable Savior in the sight of God the Father for anyone who trusts in Him. And now we see Him preparing His people over the span of 40 days after He's raised from the grave and before He ascends into heaven. He is, he is preparing them for His ascension. And Luke tells us He does so by speaking of the kingdom of God, which according to someone is shorthand for the content of the early church's preaching. So when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, it's sort of shorthand for what the apostles were preaching about. The gospel rule inside the hearts of God's people. So Jesus, over the 40-day span, was speaking about the kingdom of God, and he also specifically told the apostles, don't leave Jerusalem. The apostles would have been very nervous because of the Jews who were already frustrated enough that they were proclaiming that Jesus was alive from the grave and then Jesus was going to ascend into a heaven which was going to make everything all the more crazier. And so it would be very natural for the apostles to want to leave Jerusalem and the surrounding areas to get away from trouble. But Jesus says, don't leave. I don't want you to leave Jerusalem. He doesn't want them to leave for their good. And by the way, his commands 
are always for the good of his people, even when they're not able to attach it to their lives like the apostles wouldn't be able to here. They would have been scared to death, wanting to leave Jerusalem. Jesus says, don't go, trust me. And his commands are always good, not just to hear, but to heed, even when we can't attach them to our lives clearly. And why did he say it? Why did he tell them not to leave Jerusalem? Because there was a promise from the Father that was yet to be fulfilled. It's a promise that was prophesied back in Joel chapter 2 in the Old Testament, where God said through the prophet of Joel, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young women shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my Spirit." The promise of the Father was to pour out the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit of God, upon all people, upon all nations. And it was about to begin to happen, and it's been happening for 2,000 years. We'll be seeing it throughout the book of Acts. And so Jesus said, stay in Jerusalem. I know you're nervous. Stay here, because the Holy Spirit, who was promised, is about to come. There's a promise of a person who was about to come. Now, they'd heard about the Holy Ghost a number of times from the mouth of Jesus throughout his ministry. They'd heard three, three years before that they were going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. John baptized with water, but they'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and it's about to happen in the book of Acts. And what will happen when they're baptized with the Holy Spirit is their salvation will be sealed in Ephesians chapter 1, one of the early church leaders who we will study in the book of Acts, will see him converted from being someone who okayed the murder of Christians to becoming one of the chief leaders in the church, the Apostle Paul. He writes this in Ephesians chapter 1. In him you also, that's in Jesus, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is the one that joins and seals people to Jesus' salvation. He's the guarantee that nothing within or nothing without can ever separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ. He's the Holy Spirit seal of Jesus' salvation. And this is what he was telling the apostles to wait. Just wait. The Spirit is going to come and he's going to seal. He's going to seal the final deal of your salvation. The Holy Spirit is front and center in the book of Acts. I've said before that one of my favorite TV shows is Jeopardy. And it starts off, have you ever seen it? This is Jeopardy. Something like that. This is Acts. And it's starring, it's starring the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Now, secondly, we see that the acts of Jesus' present work in verses 6 through 8. And this is where things start to really unfold. So when they'd come together, they asked him, that's Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now the apostles ask Jesus a when question. Will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? They think the resurrected Messiah will do so. They've been under the heavy hand of the Romans. And are you now going to rise us up as a strong nation? Raise us up as a strong nation? But they're thinking a little ethnocentrically here. A Jewish-only kingdom. Kind of Jewish nationalism. As if God was for one nation more than the other nations. The book of Acts that will kill any notion of that. What they're asking is, is Israel going to rise up? Are we going to rise up and have the, the favor of God restored to us in that special way that others don't get it? That we'll be a politically and militarily strong nation of God alone where his favor rests on the Israelites? 
Is that happening? Tell us the time. Tell us the date. Is this happening now? Is that what you're going to do, risen Messiah? But God's kingdom is not like that. His kingdom is his gospel rule in the hearts of his people by the Holy Ghost for all nations, not just the Jews. So instead of a, a when answer to their when question, he gives them a what and where answer to their when question. First of all, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that God has set to do his will. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible is Deuteronomy 29.29. 29, and it reads this. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. The bottom line is, and and all of us would struggle with this to some degree, there are some things that are simply reserved for God alone. I recognize that's frustrating. It's frustrating in my own life. There are certain questions that I have, certain things that I'm curious about, like you, and the answers to those are reserved for God alone. He's just not going to tell us everything we want to know. He'll give us everything we need, but he's not going to give us everything we want to know. Secret things belong to them. There are certain secrets that are concealed by divine wisdom. But the things that are revealed, and there are countless things revealed when we read the scriptures, they belong to us, and they belong to the children of church, the church, that the people of God would grow in faith and obedience. And Jesus is saying, look, there's certain things that belong to God alone. You don't worry about that. You don't focus on that. What I want you to hear, though, is that you are going to get something. You are going to receive power as the Holy Spirit is poured out when that prophecy and that promise of the Father is fulfilled. The word for power here is dunamin. It's actually where we get our English word dynamite. And what Jesus is saying is that you will receive the dynamite of God, the power of God, an explosive power that changes everything that it comes in contact with. That's what the Holy Spirit has. That's what the Holy Spirit gives to those who know him, to those who have him, to those who know Jesus Christ. You've been given divine power. Now the power of the Holy Spirit, which we will see time and time again in the book of Acts, that explosive power of the Holy Spirit given to the children of God. That's not really something we talk a whole lot about, at least in our circles or even here specifically at Grace and Peace. It's a little intimidating to get your mind around. It's not neatly packaged to think about the Holy Spirit and His power. It's hard to get. It's a little intimidating and we rightly fear that that turns, could turn into bad theology, like the Holy Spirit is some kind of genie. I just rub the bottle the right way, and he'll give me what I want. That's, of course, not true of the Holy Spirit. He's the third person of the Godhead, together with Jesus and the Father. But, but he has and is the power of God for the believer. He is the power of God in the believer. He's the one that makes believers. He is the power to turn what is dead into that which is alive. If you're a Christian, you are because of the power, the supernatural power, the dynamite of the Holy Spirit. He alone is the one who teaches. Pastor Sherwin and I and others can prepare all the teachings we want. The only way it's applicable to your heart is because of the dynamite of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit is the only one who sanctifies you, who grows you in grace and in godliness. You're not growing yourself, and we're not growing you either. It's the power of the Holy Ghost that grows you. It's the the power of the Holy Ghost that intercedes for you right now, who prays for you. It's the power of the Holy Ghost that enables Christians to put to death The deeds of the flesh. It is not you pulling yourselves up by your moral bootstraps. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. If anything good is happening in you, give him the praise. Because he is what Jesus said he would be. The helper with divine power. Do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Do you have him? The way to have him is to first recognize 
what's really inside of you, and that's your sin and rebellion against God. Something that there's nothing you or I can do anything about to make ourselves presentable before God. But it's to recognize that God has actually done everything that's needed for you to be accepted by him in sending his son Jesus into this world to live as God and as a human being like you and me, living in accordance with the law of God perfectly, which none of us do, that enabled him to then be the human sacrifice on the cross, able to be the judgment bearer on our behalf if we trust in him so that God's judgment would never fall on us. The innocent God-man took the wrath of God, his Father, on his very own body and soul when he was put to death. But we know he has power over the grave and over our sin because he was raised from the grave. And he offers his very own lifeblood to cleanse you of your sins and to be accepted in the sight of God, not because of your righteousness, but because of the righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Has the Holy Spirit revealed to you your need of Jesus? Have you come to the place where you've said yes to Jesus? If so, the Spirit of God has taken up residence with you and he is not going anywhere. He is your power for life, the Christian life. And specifically, when we think about the book of Acts, he's the power, he's the dynamite for our witness about Jesus Christ. With the Holy Ghost and his power, the apostles were to be witnesses, Jesus' testimony bearers in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, the here and the there and the everywhere is where we are called to witness for Christ. You know, if, if the book of Acts had a table of contents, it would look something like this. Witness to Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Witness to Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Witness to Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 through 12. And then witnesses to the rest of the earth, chapters 13 through 28. We as individuals, we as a local church, we as the universal church are responsible to be the witnesses of Jesus Christ and his good news to the world by the power of the Holy Spirit, where we are regionally and globally. And you can think of our here, there, and everywhere like this. Our here is our neighborhoods in Philly. Our there is sort of the, the tri-state area moving into the northeastern United States. And then, of course, everywhere is the entire world. Wherever people are, they need to hear about the good news. Follower of Jesus, when you think about that, it, it's weighty to think about that. How does it make you feel? Does it make you feel a little overwhelmed to think about the task of reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, ask the Holy Spirit to remind you, if that's the case, to remind you it's His power through the church that reaches the world. We just get to be along for the ride, make ourselves available to be vessels, but it's His work. We just have to be willing. Maybe you feel a little afraid, and that's okay. Ask God, the Holy Spirit, to give you courage to be a witness here, there, and everywhere, wherever you're called. Maybe you think, I'm unable, I can't do this. I don't have the ability to do it. Ask God to give you patience and to give you the words that need to be spoken. Maybe you don't even really care about the world being reached for Jesus Christ. If that's true, be honest about it. And ask the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, ask the Holy Spirit to soften your heart and to give you His heart for the image bearers in the world who are no different from you and need Jesus just like you. What is his will in the church? What's his will for me? Well, it's to pray that the good news would reach the ends of the earth. It's to give our money generously. Everything we have has been given to us. Give it so the gospel will spread. Think about the world through the scope of evangelism, of sharing the gospel, not through all the stuff that you hear on the news. Think about people needing to be reached and pray for them. And we are called to be witnesses, to go as well. Listen, the task of reaching the world is still incomplete. Listen carefully. Over 40% of the world, I'm not talking about a map, I'm talking about people, souls, image bearers, destined for hell if they don't hear of the gospel and say yes. 
Over 40% of the world is unreached. They do not have access to the good news of Jesus. What does that do to your heart? Will you pray about it? Will you pray to, that God will raise up laborers for the harvest? Will you, will you think about praying about going yourself? Maybe the Lord, may, and you may think, you're absolutely crazy, Pastor Jonathan. Well, the gospel's kind of crazy. Would you think about praying? Leaving the life that you know right now? No matter where you are in life, just you think about that before the Lord in prayer. Lord, do you want me to uproot my tent and move somewhere in order to serve you so that people like me would hear of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, that's the acts of Jesus' present work. Lastly, we see the acts of Jesus' promised work. And when he'd said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood, stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. After Jesus' last words while here on earth, he was lifted up into a cloud, a cloud in the Bible often res represents the presence of God. It's kind of a way of saying, yes, Jesus is ascending into heaven. God is in all of this. This is God's will for Jesus and for his church, for him to go into heaven. And we'll see in verses 10 and 11 that they were gazing. The apostles were gazing into heaven. They were looking on. They were seeing Jesus do what we confessed earlier with the Apostles' Creed. He ascended into heaven. And that's what they were seeing. Jesus ascending into heaven into heaven. They were gazing. Now think about what they were processing. Jesus was raised from the grave. They'd heard about it. It's hard to believe initially, but he kept proving it to them over and over again. So they were rejoicing and wondering, hey, when are you going to restore the kingdom to us Jews, the kingdom to Israel? But split seconds later, he's gone again. And they'd worry like they did before after he died and was buried. Are we leaderless? Who's going to guide us? Who's going to protect us? Who's going to teach us? Who's going to care for us? But you know, by the Holy Ghost, Jesus is never far from his people. By the presence of the Holy Ghost, Jesus is always with his people, his individual person. 1 John 4, 13 reads, By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. That is, that we're together with Jesus. He's with us. Because he has given us of his Spirit. The Holy Ghost is the one who testifies that we belong to Jesus. And he is how Jesus is with us. You, if you're a believer in Jesus, wherever you are, no matter what is going on. How does this minister to you when you feel alone? How can this minister to you when you feel alone or you feel afraid or you feel sad or you're struggling with your sin and failing? or even struggling with your faith in Jesus. He is always with you if you're his. He's always for you if you are his. That's why he died, to make you his beloved forever and to give you his spirit, to take up residence inside of you with divine power. By the Holy Ghost, you are his. You have an ever-present divine living companion inside of you. When others forsake you, you have one living inside of you who never will. When others hurt you, you have one who never will. When others don't listen to you, you have one who always will. You may be by yourself, but believer in Jesus because of the Holy Spirit, you are never alone. Now, as they looked up to heaven, two men in white robes appear to them. They're there to help interpret the moment. They say, wait, look, Apostles, why are you looking into heaven? That's not where your gaze should be. Your gaze should be on what Jesus has told you to do, getting busy on the, with the calling of being a world witness for him. Of course we look to Jesus, but we're not to sit idle, just gazing, just kind of waiting, doing nothing until he returns. We are to be busy, and so it's good for us to be asking, in what ways are we more of a gazing Christian than a ba busy Christian, kind of sitting on the sidelines watching the game, rather than being involved with the game of making Christ known and disciples made in the nations. 
And the men say to them, look, he's going to come back. He's going to come back in the same way he left you. He's going to come back from heaven, not to restore the kingdom to Israel, but to do what we heard in such an excellent sermon last week, to take all of those who belong to the kingdom home to the king. Will there be no more sorry, sorrowfulness? There will be no more suffering. There will be no more sin. This is the living hope of the Christian life. And this is what's to fuel our fire to get the light of the gospel out of the church and into the world by the power of the Holy Ghost. Keep in mind the final words here of Jesus. Be my world witnesses. It's been the echo down the halls of the church for 2,000 years. It's why people are saved. It's why you've been saved from your sin and death. It's why you've been given the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. It's why our family history has been recorded in the book of Acts. For us to be a great church, a great commandment and a great commission church, growing in loving God, growing in loving others, including getting the gospel out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is worthy of us fulfilling his job description because he fulfilled his, his by giving his life over to death to give you, if you trust in him, your life back to you, to give you eternal life that you might hold out the good news of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost to others. We have come to church today. May it be so that we would go be the church in the coming week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in all of Scripture we find Jesus and the gospel, and we pray that in the, the coming year plus that you would reveal uh, Jesus and the gospel and its implications from the book of Acts. Teach us to be a great commandment church, a great commission church, sharing the gospel, loving you and sharing the gospel with others. Spirit, we need you and your power to walk worthy as Christians. We need you to love uh, others like you want us to. We need you to be the witness that you want us to be as well. And so we pray for the grace of your power and the power of your grace, and we will give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, if you have a little one in nursery, please go get them. And just a reminder that if you're a member of Grace and Peace, that's a great way to serve our church to help out in the nursery ministry. Uh, you could talk to Pastor Sherwin and me if you'd like to do that. A uh, few announcements. Uh, every week we talk about giving. We do so unashamedly. What we do with our wallets is part of how we worship. And so we encourage you to be generous givers like Jesus has been generous to us that the gospel really would be known here and abroad. Uh, you can give online. You can also give with the boxes uh, near the exits. Uh, reminder for those of you that maybe didn't uh, know this, that we have Sunday school for kindergarten through fifth graders in between our services. So if you're coming to the Second service, and you have a little person, please come early so uh, they can enjoy Sunday school. We also have youth group tonight for students 6th through 12th grade, 5.30 to 7.30 here at the property. Uh, and there's food, which is always a good draw. So please come if you're in that age bracket. We've got some Bible studies starting up this week, one for men, one for women. Uh, contact information is behind me, but you can also talk to Pastor and me about that as well. Two more. Uh, Sunday, the 24th of October, after the 11 o'clock service, we're going to have our next membership class. It's a great way to learn about membership, con connecting formally here at Grace and Peace. It doesn't obligate you to anything. Maybe you're already a member. Um, think about folks that maybe aren't yet members that you might know of, encouraging them to come so they could hear about our church. Lastly, we have these fancy postcards. You might have seen them when you came in. If not, grab them. We even have magnets too, so you can put them on your refrigerator. It just gives you some of the events that we have this fall. We've got a busy fall. I'm very encouraged and excited. We have so much going on again, um, and this is a way to keep up with those things. Great. Well, let's pray as we approach the table. Let's pray. God, we do want to uh, pray and ask you to bless our giving, receive our gifts, use our gifts to make known the great name of Jesus, both here in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and also abroad in the world. And we also thank you for this meal, because no matter what we can give to you, it pales in comparison to what you've given to us. And this meal that you've given to us, you set forth and you invited us to, this meal powerfully shows us and reminds us of what you have given to us in Jesus. And so we pray that 
Uh, We would know you and your abounding grace to weak and needy sinners like us. Feed, strengthen, nourish your flock right now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to read from Scripture. This is God's Word. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. If you're here today and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, hear the gracious, passionate invitation of your Savior to this meal. He says, take, eat, do this, remember me, drink. This is your Savior offering to you this table. He's put this food and drink before you. Take it. It is good for you. You need it. If you're here today and you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, we're so glad you're here. But we need to say to you that this meal is not yet for you. This is a family-only meal, and you're not yet a part of the family of God. So don't take the meal, but we do implore you, take Jesus. Jesus is offered to you by God through your hearing of the word today. Receive him. If you want to talk about that, you want more processing around that, I'm here, Pastor John is here, a number of leaders are here. We really would love to talk to you, so please talk to us. In just a moment, Pastor Jonathan and myself, we're going to come to the front here. We're going to have trays of pre-packaged communion meals. Come down the aisle to the front. When you see us up front, come down the middle aisles and hold out your hand. We'll give you the meal. If you need gluten-free bread, just ask. We have that. Uh, Once you get your meal, return to your seat through the outer aisles. Uh, Wait till everyone's been seated. At that point, I'm going to come back up here and lead us in taking the meal together. Friends, please with me now remove the plastic film from the top to get the wafer. Brothers and sisters, this is the body of Christ that was broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, please peel back the foil to get the juice.
Brothers, sisters, this is the blood of Jesus that was spilled to forgive you of all your sins. Drink of it, all of you. Amen. Please hang on to the cup and you can discard it later as you exit the service. Let's pray once more. God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for giving up your one and only Son for us. And we thank you for powerfully reminding us each and every day of it. We thank you even for this meal that you give to strengthen our faith. We love you, we worship you, and we ask that as we seek to represent you well to a watching world in the coming week, would you give us strength and would you help us to do that for Jesus' sake. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and respond to God's word. As we sing this, let's, uh, let's ask God to empower us and to give us boldness this week to share his good news with this world. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done so that everyone might know your name. Let your song be heard everywhere on earth till your sovereign work on earth is done. Let your kingdom come. Your glorious cause, O oh God, engages our hearts. May Jesus Christ be known. Wherever we are, we ask not for ourselves, but for your renown. The cross has saved us, so we pray your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. Let your
Amen, amen. Let his kingdom come when we are taken home to be with the king himself. Oh, what a glorious day that'll be. Well, we are so glad we've been able to be together. Pastor and I really mean it when we say we're here to serve you, so if we can pray for you or help guide you in this life or connect you to some resource that might help you, uh, we really want to do that. That's why God has called us and set us aside, much like he did the early apostles, to serve the church. We are your servants, so please let us know how we can do so. encourage you to uh, get rid of your communion cup uh, by the waste bins when you leave, but don't encourage you to leave right away. Stick around, enjoy one another. Uh, and because we are able to do so, it is a wonderful thing. As we move into the new week and we try to be the church, maybe just in some small ways, having been to church, we try to be the church, to represent Jesus into the world, uh, a new and unused week. Let's use it for the advancement of the good news, maybe in small ways, maybe in big ways, but let's be busy and not sitting on the sideline. So receive this final word from God in this service today. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.